Bell's algorithm for PLS is exactly the same procedure as PCA. PCA, though, we don't have this right hand side. We only have the T's and the, and the, and the matrix that are called P in PCA. But the PCA Bell's algorithm calculates the regressions of the column of X onto T and gets you your loadings. And then it comes back and calculates your scores. It calculates your loadings, your scores, and it alternates between those two directions until convergence. That's PCA for, for one data block. Conceptually, just try and do the following in your mind. Take a look at just the Y matrix. And ignore the, the, where these arrows, the red and the green arrows go. But you can also see, well, what if I just did PCA on my Y space. And I calculate my loadings here C, and I calculate my loadings U. And I alternate between those two until convergence. Okay? And then I calculated my U matrix as scores for my Y space, and my C matrix are loadings for my Y matrix. So you can just do PCA on your Y space and flip these two sides around. And you would see then what you've done after that is you've calculated scores in U and you've calculated scores in T. The scores in T would correspond to your X space scores and the scores in U would correspond to your Y space. These U's would explain Y the best possible. The scores T would explain X best possible. But there's no covariance necessarily or correlation between T and U because they've been calculated independently of each other. But notice that with only very minor changes in the arrow. So the red arrow would normally, for doing PCA, would start at U and flip between C and U to C and U, go down four, come back up five, go down four, come back up five, till convergence. And on the PCA for the X space, the green arrow would actually start here at T. Calculate your loading, come back, and calculate your score, loading score. Okay? But all that PLS, Nihal's algorithm does is just changes the origin of these two arrows so that they begin on the opposite spaces scores and they calculate. That way you get all the data coming through. So maybe I should have explained it after I looked at this diagram, but uh, for some of you that might be a good way to see it. That it's kind of like PCM each space separately, but they're calculated together. And in fact, that's how it's explained by one of the original papers that I posted on the website this morning. I said, if you had time before the class, take a look at that paper. If you haven't, didn't get a chance to read it prior to today's class, still go download it and read it, because that's actually how the conceptual um, idea for PLS came about, was recognizing that the scores here for X and loadings for X are calculated. Then the loadings and scores for Y are calculated, but there's really no relationship. So how can we get a relationship between them? We'll just change the, the position of where the algorithm starts from. So let's take a look at that um, in a little, in, in very quickly, um, quick overview. So we'll start with x and y. We will pre-process them. Call those x zero and y zero. So it indicates that there's no components just yet. And the algorithm is exactly the same structure as the PCA algorithm. The only thing is we've added these extra steps in here. So start with an initial column for U this time. For the, we'll begin on the Y space. You can begin on the X space, but by convention we begin on the Y space. We call, select an arbitrary column U. We'll regress the columns from X onto U to get weights. We'll normalize those weights, regress rows from X onto the weights to get scores. The y's and the t's to get c's, and the y's and the c's to get the u's, and we'll begin all over again. So let's take a look at it in picture form. Select any column for u. Uh, you can pick a column for y, a column of random numbers, the same as before, as long as you don't take a column with zeros. And proceed as follows. This is the step one marked over here on the arrows. So step 2.1 corresponds to this green arrow here for one. Regress every column from X onto U. So go, we've got our starting column U that we've picked randomly, or we've chosen a column from the Y space. And we're going to regress a column from our X space onto that U vector and calculate a, a, a slope which we'll call W. Store that as the slope for the corresponding column. We go to the next column, regress that column onto U, and store its slope coefficients, 
and so on. Or you can just do it in one go using that equation shown up. Then step two says to normalize that loading. So that loading won't necessarily have um, unit length, or let me write, I should call this a weight. If you could please correct the notes that normalize the weights. I don't want to call them loadings just yet. So PLS, the W's will call them weights. So that weight won't necessarily have unit length. We'll rescale it to unit length. That's step two. That's why I put the sub the two here next to the, the weight w to illustrate that step two in that decals algorithm inside the while loop corresponds to that rescaling of the w. The third step, we now go back up and we regress the row from x onto the weight w to calculate the corresponding t. And you repeat that for every row in x. Do that in one go. So rather than doing a separate regression row by row by row, you can calculate all the whole column of t in one go using that equation, which is exactly related to x transpose x inverse x transpose y. I've just substituted the fact that we're regressing x onto w. The fourth step said once we've got these scores t now. We're going to use them, and we're going to regress every column from y onto those scores t, and then calculate slope coefficients, store that in the c. So these c's then will be the loadings for the y space. And then finally, we'll take that loading from the y space in step five, and we'll complete the cycle get back to our views as follows. We'll regress the row from y onto vector c and store that corresponding slope coefficient in the two. So I don't really want to belabor all of these details. It's the uh, same idea as PCA, but please go through it at your own time. I know it's very, very overwhelming the first time you see this. So I, what I really want to get through is just, it's a series of alternating regressions and We'll, we started with the U matrix. By the time we come to the end of the while loop, we would have updated that U vector. And we'll keep cycling until convergence, which um, is easy to check. We'll just see if U from one iteration to the next stop changing. I could have also used T's. Okay? There's no reason why I used the U's. I could use T and make sure that T from one iteration to the next has stopped changing. And when the number of iterations is, is greater than 300, just in case it doesn't converge. Well, I certainly haven't seen that happen for PLS. PLS converges actually much, much faster than PCA. Um, so you should never really need to uh, have the same head, but just put it there in case. And after convergence, we will now have four vectors. The score vector T for the X space, the W weights for the X space, the score vector U for the Y space, and the, and the C vector for loadings for the Y space. Those four vectors form the eighth component. We'll just store them in the corresponding matrix in T, W, U, and C. Yeah. So deflation then. Once we converge, we now need to remove from the X and the Y matrix the part that we can explain, which is, is, is given by these scores. Okay, so what we do in the Hell's algorithm for PLS is we actually introduce back again this loadings matrix P. Uh, this loadings matrix P is we take the converged score T and we take our columns from X. We regress the column from X onto that converged T and we calculate a loadings vector P. Okay, this, this part tells us we're taking the T, which describes the, the score for the X space, and we're going to regress columns from X onto T and store those slope coefficients into the vector P. That part T and P, the T vector and the P vector, similarly to PCA, tells us how much 
we can explain of the x matrix. We're going to subtract that from the x matrix. So we say x minus x hat, where x hat is in TP transpose, so it's the same, same as in PCA. We deflate from x the part we can explain. So x is what we started off with, xa minus 1. Subtract off the a component, and we get the matrix of residuals. Similarly for the y space, we'll take our y matrix and subtract off the part of the y space we can to make the TC transpose. And we'll store that as the residuals for the y space. So we'll call those residuals F. So we've got a matrix of residuals E for the x space and a matrix of residuals F for the y space. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, no, it is TC transpose. Yes, it is, uh, and yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about, about a bit about that later on, okay? So what, I, what I, I don't necessarily need you to understand the details of exactly what's going on here. There's actually much more richness in this explanation that I could go into. Uh, I'll leave that for, for the next class. But really, what I, the main idea is that we're removing from the X matrix and we're removing from the Y matrix the parts we can explain. And then we're going ahead and calculating the second component on the residuals. Okay. Now, this slide as well can be a little bit overwhelming. It is unfortunately something we have to discuss in order to understand when we look at the software hardware. And <laughs> so let's take a look at it as follows. T1 can be calculated as follows. We calculate T1 by saying x times w. So this is the same as in PCA. In PCA we said T is equal to x times P. We have the same concept here. We say x times w, the weights for the x based matrix, will get us our scores T1. Okay. Unfortunately, calculating T2 is a little bit more complicated. Because when we, when we do the knee pulse algorithm, after calculating T1, we go ahead and deflate the X matrix. So we subtract from X the part we can explain, T1, P1 transpose. And this quantity here in brackets, which is uh, called X1, so then X1 is the, is the actual matrix that was used to calculate the second component. So the second component was, ex was calculated on this deflated matrix X, which is X0 minus T1, P1 transpose. We calculated the W2s, or second components direction, was actually not calculated on the, on the original X matrix. It was in fact calculated on the deflated X matrix. Okay. So T2 is then calculated from X minus T1, P1 transpose. W. Now, that makes it a little bit hard to interpret because when we're looking at, at a loading or a weight plot for the X space, say W1 versus W2, in the same way we would have looked at PCA, P1 versus P2, we, in PLS we'll look at W1 versus W2. That can be confusing because W2 wasn't calculated on the X matrix, it was in fact calculated on the deflated X matrix. So what we would really like instead is could we have some way where we take our, our starting matrix, x0, and we calculate, I'm going to call them loadings, uh, weights w star, calculate t1 so that it's calculated by taking the x matrix multiplied by w star 1, and t2 is calculated from the original x matrix, not the deflated matrix this time, times w star 2. It's clear from this first equation in this, sec in this part and that part, that W1 and W star 1 are going to be identical. Okay. But where they're going to start to differ is that W star 2 is not going to be quite the same as W2. But what is nice about the W stars rather than the Ws is that they show the relationship between the variables directly rather than on the deflated variables. Okay. And W stars is a little bit involved, but it's not too hard to show that calculated from that matrix relationship over there. Similarly, we would like to be able to get our, so sorry, not similarly, but we would like to then get our scores in one go as well. 
which we can do if we use a W star matrix. So over here we would have to calculate T1, then deflate, calculate T2, then deflate, calculate T3, and so on. Is it possible to go directly from X and calculate all our scores in one go? It is if we use X times W star, because the W stars have been calculated to relate the X matrix directly to the scores. So in fact, when we look at the software, we'll look at the W stars instead of the Ws because it gives us a relationship between the variables in a clearer way. So we don't have to take this deflation into account. Okay. So a lot of you are looking very confused right now. So I think it's going to really help if we solidify this in, in the software. Um, so what I'm going to, I'll come back to some of these slides perhaps in a minute. But the key point that I want you to get across from today's class is that PLS conceptually follows the same procedure as PCA which is one of the reasons why I've spent a lot of time in PCA. Um, we've looked at scores, we've looked at loadings. Uh, sorry, we looked at loadings in the PCA space, we looked at Hotel T squared, SPE, R squared. All those same plots are available to us in PLS. The only new plots that we have are the W star plots, and we have now also have loadings plots for the Y space. So remember we've got our C vector for the Y space. Um, but other than that, we've got all the same plots. Maybe this one here, the VIP plot, is the only one I haven't really spoken about too much. So I, I probably won't get a chance to talk about that today, but it's not critical. We'll look at that next class. But I'm going to show you now in the software, we've got about another 30 minutes or so. Let's work through a case study that you've seen before and look at how a PLS model would work on that data set. Okay, so if you get your laptops up, we're going to look at this LGPE case study. You should have this. Uh, File downloaded from the web already. Uh, we've looked at this in the previous class. So while you're getting your laptop up, let's just quickly recap. Remember, this is a case study we're not using plans for a We're putting our reagents in over here for temperature, and then we're going down this long tube, which is about two kilometers long, one flow. And so we put our solvents, our initiator, and that comes out inlet temperature, those materials react. Somewhere along the profile of the pipe here, we can plot the temperature, but somewhere along the profile, we reach a certain maximum temperature. And that distance along the pipe is called say one. It comes out the first part of the reactor at some outlet temperature, then we add initial reagents. Uh, sorry, the second batch of reagents, solvent 2, initiated 2 at, at the same inlet temperature, so T and same inlet temperature there. That's what causes that initial cooling under there. But very quickly, as we proceed down the second half of the reactor, we reach a maximum temperature at a Z2 distance. And then at the outlet, we get this. We've also got counter current cooling coming the T1. So that's just a recap of the data. Those are the process variables. Those are our x variables. What we're interested in today's class is relating those x data, the temperatures, the flow rates, and so on, the pressure in the reactor. We want to use those to relate them to the conversion from the reactor. So these are our y variables. We measure conversion, the number average molecular weight, the weight average molecular weight, the number of long chain branches and the number of short chain branches. So I know a few of you are not in chemical engineering, um, but one way to see this is that this is our quality space. We're going to produce our product to meet these certain quality criteria for our customers. The process has a number of X variables, I think there's 14 of them, 14 X variables, and we're going to use those 14 X variables and relate them and see how they're related to the whole. Okay. Now, let me stress here, in this particular case study, the objective was not to try and predict y from the x. Okay. We could easily do that, and you'll see the plots for that in the software. But really what we want to get from this case study is to understand how the x's affect the y, and how the y's are related to each other, and how the x's are related to each other. So, what I want to do initially, so in other words, to put it in perspective, what we're trying to do in this case study is to learn from the data, understand our process a bit more. 
but particularly we want to see how the x's over here influence the y's. Okay. So you've all got, you all have the LDP software, uh, uh, data set, right? Yeah. Okay, so in the software you open the data file, as you normally would. And would be your usual variables and then the last four or five columns are those uh, Y variables, conversion, MA, MW, long chain branch and short chain branch. So you don't need to do anything special just yet to do a PL, to get a PLS. Just say okay, we're just importing the data first. Say finish at this point. And you could go inspect your raw data in this window. Go look at all the variables. We're going to accept all the data for now and just say okay. Save that model. Okay, so this is where, where it changes from normal. So notice down here at the bottom it says this model is a PCA model. So if we had to go hit okay right now, we would just be building a PCA model. What we do want to do is build a PLS. And um, first though, go ahead and exclude the last four observations because those are outliers. We know that from the previous class. I don't want to build this model with outliers, so just delete observations 51, 2, 3, and 4. Say exclude. So everyone's excluded those four. Please make sure you have excluded those four, otherwise your uh, screen won't match what you see after this. Then go to variables. And you see here, this block here is called LDPE.csv. This is actually, I, I, really, I really should have renamed this earlier, I forgot. But this is going to be my X block, LDPE.csv. I should have called that X earlier. Um, so if I want that as my X block, I really have to go remove those last five variables. Those last five columns, I don't want them in my X space, I, I need them in my Y space. So select the last five, hit exclude. Is there one below? Then go back up to the blocks tab. So maybe I can rename it here. Let's see if I double click. Oh no, I have, it's too late. For that. Okay, what I want to do is create a new block. So create a new block, scroll down to the bottom, select those five variables, push them over, call this block Y, and the block type should also be set as a Y. So it's very important to say, tell the software that the type of data in this block is, a, is Y type data. In other words, it's going to assume, immediately know that this is data that needs to be in the, on the prediction side of the, of the data set, in the, in the Y block. Okay, so yeah, I called my block Y, but I could have called this anything. The software is not going to pick up that this is a Y block based on my name here. The way the software knows it's Y is by the block type. Okay, so to make that explicit, I'm going to call my block name here quality. Clear it up. So this is, these are my output variables or my quality variables in this case. Data. So say OK. Oh, this is a problem. Um, this still says there's 19 variables. There should be fewer than this quality. So just go to here. Oh, OK. Go here. Oh, so the variables here, quality. Okay. Yeah. So in this drop down, I think there's there's a glitch over here. This they aren't 19 variables. It's 14 variables. And this should say this is a PLS model. I'm not sure why it's not saying that. Um, yeah. Is it Yeah. 
Volvo, not a PLSDA. Oh. PLSDA we'll look at in, in two or three classes from now. It's a, it is a PLS model, yeah. So let's just say okay, see what happens. It's just a software bug. I'm just going to call it base model. Okay, no, so it has picked up as a PLS model. Over here. That's the important part. That other that other thing was probably misleading in a way. Okay, so before we go fit the model, let's just make sure you all have the same information here. Yeah? If I expand this a little bit, so that there must be you should see the following. You could you you called your model whatever you called it. Type must be PLS. So everyone has that. Your A is zero, we haven't fit any components. N is 50. Number of observations. K is 14 for our X space. One normal block, zero batch blocks, one normal Y block with five quality variables. And our R squared, we don't have it in there. Okay, so has everyone got that? Okay, great. So let's go fit our PLS model. And just for now, let's just take two components. So click on the on the wheel with uh, two cogs and fit just two components. R squared values is given over here, 63% for the first component and 26% for the second component. Those are the R squared values for the Y space. Okay, so by default, the software, when it reports R squared values to you in a PLS model, will give you the R squared for the Y space overall. So you predicted all five Y variables with about the total R squared of 84%. Now that means some variables could be very well predicted and other variables poorly predicted, but the overall R squared for the Y space is 84%. Okay. I mean, one thing, what, um, in the software, in the notes rather, sorry, I, I gave the printout of a few plots. Um, and the reason for doing that is so that you can add any annotations to that. So if, uh, in particular, when we talk about the weights plot next, you might want to add some notes onto your page just to, just to um, remind yourself of what, how to interpret that plot. Okay? So I don't think I have this one on there, but you could easily, this one's clear to understand. R squared in a PLS model is usually referring to the Y space variance explained. Now, you can go look at the R squared values for each variable. And I'm going to have to take a look at how to do this. I can't remember if it's on my head. Sorry, I'm just trying to take a look. Oh. Okay, so R squared, we need R squared for the X space variables and the Y space variables as follows. Go to analyze, then to model, and under variable summary. So this will give us a summary of how well we explain the variables. And then you have to pick your block. Is it the X block, which I called LDP or CSV, or the quality block? So if you pick the quality block with two components, we're able to explain the x squared, the r squared for the variables as follows. So clearly we can explain conversion mn, uh, but we explain mw relatively less compared to some of the other variables. And as you add components, those, those r squared values will go up for all the five variables. Okay. If you take the r squared values for the x space, that's uh, in the same way, you just click Analyze, Model, Variable Summary, and this time in the drop-down, you leave it as the X space, you say OK, we'll get uh, the plot shown over here. So our model for the X space is, is explaining certain variables quite well, but other variables are very poorly explained for those two components. OK? 
Okay, so the inlet temperature one and two is not well explained. The flow rate of the solvent at the first inlet and at the second inlet position was the, the pressure not well explained by the model. Okay, so that's uh, the R squared values. We can also look at the score plot. So the score plot here is T1 versus T2. The add series. I don't think those, none of those work. Uh, you can plug it in as well. So T1 versus T2 then is interpreted exactly in the same way as before. Let's take a look at the first component explains the first component explains about 60% of the and the second component 20%. So bearing that in mind then this first direction is obvious is the same as the PCA. It explains the most variation, the second component the next greatest source of variation. And points that cluster close together in the score space uh, the same interpretation as PCA, they, they're close together. And a point that's far outside the scores or away from the others would be considered unusual. So here's, for example, observation 33 is lying a little bit further from the rest of the data than, than the other points. So we're going to investigate that observation in a minute. Also observation 16. We could also, we could ask, for example, why is observation 16 so far out over here? And what would you use to look at that, to try and answer that? Contribution plot, or the weights plot, in this case, the load, the double loop. Okay, so, so there's nothing really different to, to PLS from PCA, other than underlying this model is that the weights and the scores have been calculated in a slightly different way. The, um, one plot I do want to spend some time on next is the weight plot. So if you go to an analyze loading plot, and remember we said earlier on, so this is important, let's just take a look at it. There's, there's two, two uh, important vectors for the, the, for the X space and the Y space. The W vectors for the X space and the C vectors for the Y space. What we can do, though, is plot both of those superimposed on, on each other. And so the Ws for the X space, will, like I said, we look at the W stars. We look at W star 1 versus W star 2. In fact, let's just do that for now. Look, look, look at W star 1 and then look at W star 2, and then we'll look at the superimposed plot. So in the drop-down, they just change that to W star 1, W star 2, and say add series. And what I'd like you to do is, if you still have your score plot open from before, it's helpful to put the two side by side. So, you, everyone got their plots rearranged. Okay, we'll just take a look here on the screen if you don't get it. So, the W's then, are the, or the W stars are the, the two vectors that really describe how the X data are aligned. And then the scores, the T values, are the corresponding scores from the X matrix. So if we take a look at that, we can see then the relationship between these X space variables. We see that Z1 and Z2, these two variables have a large negative W1 value. Okay, so these two variables from the W1 direction, it's the um, horizontal direction here, let me just shoot this up so you can see the axis labels. So the W1 direction here horizontally, Z1 and Z2 have large W1 values. So from the W1 perspective, they're positively correlated. These two variables down here, I can't see them actually. Uh, T max 2 and Fi2. So Tmax2 
and the flow rate inlet to these two variables are extremely tightly correlated. And that makes intuitive sense from the system's approach. The maximum temperature which we reached inside the reactor is exactly correlated with the inlet flow rate of the initiator. So the more initiator we add at the second position, the higher the temperature. And it's exactly, that makes sense. It's the initiator which, which uh, causes that exothermic reaction. So the more initiator flow we add, the higher the temperature at, the set, at T max two. So these two variables are very strongly correlated. We also see some negative correlation here. So we can go through this diagonal direction. T max one is negatively correlated with Z one. So the higher the maximum temperature we see, the, so the higher value, the earlier it occurs in the reactor. So Z1 being a lower value means we've shifted earlier in the reactor, it's a lower value, is related to a higher T max one. They're negatively correlated, so a low Z1 is related with a high T max one. That peak position, let's just go back here, so Z1 is the distance along, the lower that value is, the higher that is. So it indicates that the hot spot peak is higher, has a higher temperature the earlier, if it occurs earlier on upstream in the, in the, in the reactor tube. Okay. So the loadings here are interpreted in exactly the same way as you would interpret it from a PCA. And the interpretations uh, would be no different than before. The only, the only thing to be aware is, is use the W stars. Don't use the Ws. Because the W stars give you the relationships in the original variables. Let's take a look at the Cs. The Cs are the corresponding weights for the PLS Y space. So under analyze loading plot, pick C1 and C2 and say add series. Okay, so what do you what do you notice here in this particular plot? Any any interesting things you pick up? So you're, you're, okay, you're going to the next step where you're trying to superimpose the two plots already, which is great. I'm just, but let's just, let's just step back. Oh. These are the five Y variables. Okay, so we've got our X space and our Y space. And these are the weights. No, what you did is great. Um, we'll just look at that next level. Don't worry about it. So we've got our X space with 14 columns. And we've got our Y space with five columns. And for the Y space, we have C. And for the X space, we have W. W star. Okay. We've looked at the W stars. These give us the relationships in the X variables. The Cs give us the relationships amongst the Y variables. Okay. So we're seeing that conversion and long chain branching, these two Y variables move them up and down together. They're correlated with each other. Okay. And SCB is also positively correlated with, with these two variables. Okay? Because this first component, C1, explains about 60% of the variation. The second component explains about 20% of the variation. So these, these loadings here, the C1 values for those three variables are roughly, roughly the same. They move, they move quite tightly to, together. Inversely correlated to those three variables in the Y space is the MN, so the number average molecular weight. This is negatively correlated 
with these variables. So if you're producing a product, this is the out outlet of our reactor, with high number average molecular weight, what would you say in general about the conversion? This is a high, a high value. It would be lower. So conversion would, have, would be lower. You'd have fewer number of long chain branches and a fewer number of short chain branches, but you'd get a higher average number of molecular weight. The weight average molecular weight, this variable over here, MW, that's in its own direction. It's in the T2 direction. It's got zero influence in its first component. So the second component primarily explains variation with number average molecular weight. The first component explains variation with weight at, uh, number average molecular weight, sorry, and the second component with weight average molecular weight, MW. Okay. Now we can go to sorry, what's the difference between this MW and MN? They're orthogonal to each other in general. You can you can vary the number average and the molecular the MN and the MW variables independently of each other. Or tend to vary independently of each other. Okay. Now we can go look at um, what what you wanted to do there earlier was to look at the two plots simultaneously. And that's the W star C plot. If we go to the loadings plot, and and the default setting is in fact W star C. Just note that this is not W times C. That's the only unfortunate side effect of calling this W star, is that some people sometimes think that's W multiplied by C. It's not, it's just W star and the C plot superimposed on top of each other. And that's emphasized, uh, and series, so, okay. That's emphasized by the fact that the C's are drawn in red and the W stars are drawn in black. Okay, and this plot is, this is what you have there. This plot is the most powerful plot, in my opinion, of PLS for understanding the relationships between variables because it's showing you how the X space and the Y space are related to each other. Remember, the W stars are the relationships in the X space, the C's are the relationships in the Y space. And those two directions were calculated at the same time so that they had maximum correlation in their, in their respective scores for the X and the Y space. So it's a great plot to look at because we're asking now, how can we adjust our quality space? By, uh, sorry, how can we achieve changes in our quality space by adjusting our X variables? So let's take an example. If we wanted to increase the short chain branching, increase the conversion, increase the LCD. Okay, so we want to increase these Y variables. We know that that is related with a decrease in MN. We can't increase MN and increase LCD and increase conversion. We know that if we're going to increase these variables in red here, conversion, LCD, and SCD, that's going to be related with a decrease in MN. So we accept that. If we want to produce a product with high short chain branches, high number of long chain branches, high, achieve higher conversion with a lower number average molecular weight, what are some of the things we can adjust in our reactor in order to achieve those objectives? Sorry? Team Max 1 and FI1. Increase F FI1, so increase our flow rate of initiator. That will result in T Max 1 being greater. It will also result in Z1 being smaller. We're going to see that peak hotspot earlier on in the reactor, which makes sense because we're loading up initiator more and more. So that, that flow rate is higher. We're going to see that Z1 occur earlier. Z2 will also occur slightly earlier. And we have those two that you can Sorry? Then we have the two in that yeah. that are like marks. T out, sorry. The, no, two. the ones that are between the quality, like you can't see them, they're all smudged together. Oh, right. Okay, yeah, so there is a variable there. Which is that one? I think it's FI2. FI2, yeah. T max. T max 2. Okay, so yeah, you could increase T max 2, uh, although T max 2 isn't something you can manipulate, so you have to change something in the process to achieve a higher T max 2. Um, now, that's the first component. The second component, if you want to achieve a higher 
weight average molecular weight, so high MW values, what might you do? Smaller TA, because they're negatively correlated here. Okay, so if you wanted a higher value of that, you would operate at low TA. Okay. So I think you're starting to see how to interpret the plots. Despite the complexity underlying the calculations, the interpretation of these plots is really no different to what you've seen before from PCA. Yeah. Uh, some of these variables will be like correlated. Yeah. One variable is independent, another variable will be dependent on it. Right. Even generally, like the whole variable and the other variable. Right. That's what I mean. So right. we find about this one and some of these plots are VLS. No, you have to use your knowledge of the process to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, because you put in your x variables both variable types of variables that can be manipulated, variables that are just responses to those manipulations. But the software doesn't know that there's anything else between those two columns. Now, we also what one thing to show is to overlay with the W star C plot is to look at the scores plot. Okay, so if we look at the scores then. If you still have that up here, T1, T2, what might have been the reason, without using a contribution plot, what might have been the reason for a, for observation 8 being so high up here, T2? A high value there for observation 8. Without generating contributions, why would you think Observation 8 is so high up there in a T2 score. TIM? High values of TIM. Low values of the, the quality variable. Okay, so let's, let's see if we can confirm that. If we take observation 8 and uh, we ask for a contribution plot. It shows that TN was high. So that confirms that. But it also shows Z1 low and uh, Z2 higher than normal. Okay, so the, the, the loadings plot it gives, you, gives you a general sense of the relationship between the variables. And so TN, that observation is high because TN is high, Z1 is low, that makes sense, and Z2 is low. That one probably doesn't make too much sense in terms of the large part, but that's okay because remember these are just linear combinations. Okay. Why would observation 33 be out, out here? So observation 33 has a large negative T1 value. High T mass, you said? Low T mass. High. Yeah, so let's just double check that in the contribution plot. So make sure that when you select a contribution, it's got a red square around it, not a blue square. Okay, because that's our starting point for the contribution. So, yeah, it's got a high Z1 and high Z2. It's got a low Z max 2 and Z max 1, like we said. So, those three, we, there were two others that we didn't pick up. Z, Z max 2, which we can go and look at, and FI2. So that point is an outlier or different from the others because the operation at that point in time was given by this sort of profile. So we changed things on our process to get a higher Z1 and a, and a higher Z2, lower maximum temperature at, at those positions over there. Okay, so the interpretation, that's what I want to stress here, is really no different to, to PCA. Other than that you've got some additional plots to look at. You've got uh, w stars and C's, but we, we, we combine that by looking at the W star C plot. Yeah. You've got your scores and you've got your SPE. Let's take a look at SPEs. Can we ask a question? Yeah. Um, I don't understand how you could get high Z1 and high Z2. Like I get having one or the other, but 
Okay, so this point is up here, over here. It's got a high value of a, a, a large negative of T1. It means that variables that are on the negative end in the W plot over here are, are above average. So we've got high Z1 and high Z2. So that you get your data point over here. Okay. So yeah, in practice, what you did to achieve yeah. that might be something I, I can't tell how that was achieved, but this is what we recorded in, on our data. We recorded the highs in one and the two. Probably in practice, what you did is you increase the flow rate of the addition in zone one and zone two to, to achieve that. So we can also look at um, SPE plots. And I didn't really speak about this too much. Uh, or I don't think I covered it at all. So here we've got W star, here we've got C. But once we've calculated the scores for x, so we've got our t1 and we've got our new one scores, we can calculate residuals. We can calculate a matrix of residuals for the x space. We can calculate a matrix of residuals n for the y space. And those residuals we can calculate for d mod x, uh, sorry, SPE for the x space. And we can calculate for the y space SPE. So they have the usual interpretation. A low SPE value means that that observation is close to the model plane in the X space, or a low SPE Y has got a, it's a low distance to the plane in the Y space. These are used to detect outliers in the data set. So square prediction error under the analyze menu. And you can choose which block you would like this from. The X space block or the Y space block. Okay, so the default is the X space block, or you could go look at the Y space block and, and plot the SPE. So after two components, sure there are some moderate outliers, which we could go investigate using the usual contribution plots. The final uh, set of plots I, I just want to take a look at is, uh, there's two sets of plots that I want to take a look at before we break, or oh, before we end, is <clears throat> the observed versus predictive plot. So this is if you were using PLS as a predictive tool, this would be a great plot to try and understand how well you did from a prediction perspective. So it's going to show us for the training data, for the quality block, which variable? I just want to, there's five variables. Let's just take a look at the first one. Say okay. <clears throat> it shows us then observed value of conversion. This is what we actually recorded versus our predicted value for conversion on the on the horizontal axis. And it shows that with the 45 degree line. So perfect predictions means those points would be exactly on the 45 degree line. But because we're not able to predict perfectly, of course, that we see some scatter around the line. The closer those points are to the line, the better our predictions are. The number that's reported up here is the root mean squared error of estimation. I'll, I'll talk about it, we'll look at it in the next class, but just so if you're curious, uh, root mean squared error of estimation is equal to your errors squared and then you take the root mean squared error of estimation. So root mean squared, so there's a square, take the mean of that. So take your errors squared and calculate the mean and then take the root of that. <laughs> right, so root mean squared error of estimation. Calculate your sum of your squares. Uh, sorry, take your vector of your prediction errors, square them, then you calculate the average of that, and then take the square root of it. So it's in other words, it's just roughly the, roughly the standard deviation of your residuals for that y variable. One way to visualize it that I like to show sometimes is if I had to plot two parallel lines with a distance is the RMSE above and below, that line would be the kind of the one standard deviation cutoff. So points that are outside that RMSE distance are not well predictable. They're more than one standard deviation away. Okay. 
So this is a good number to use. This is a much better number to use than r squared because it's, it's, it's actually in the units of the variable that you're predicting. So if you took this to your boss and say, well, I'm able to predict conversion within this small degree of error, that's more, it's more interpretable than saying I've got an R squared of 86%. This, is a, this actually means it's more useful to what you're actually trying to achieve. Uh, in the drop down here, we can change that to some of the other y variables. There's the number average molecular weight, which is extremely well predicted. We can, we've got a root mean squared error of estimation of, of 69 units. So con contrast that to your y axis range, which goes from 26,000 to 28,000. Being able to predict within plus or minus 69 units is, is pretty good. Uh, the weight average molecular weight, we've got a little bit more scatter. Long chain branching and then short chain branching. So we've got five five Y variables. We get an observed versus predicted for every one of them. The final plot to take a look at it was just to come full circle here with PLS. Remember, we said PLS's objective is to maximize covariance between T and U. So why don't we plot T versus U? Take a look at what how strong that covariance is. So analyze under the score plot option though. We're going to plot the scores T1 on the x-axis and the scores for U1 on the y-axis. T1 versus U1, add the series, say OK. And we're seeing this is what the PLS was really trying to maximize, is this correlation here. It's pretty strong. Okay, So this correlation is not 1, but it's pretty close to 1. And we can also plot in the drop down here, the second component must have lower correlation than the second component. Because the first component tried to maximize that correlation, the second component slightly poorer correlation. So that 45 degree line really should have been drawn here in the software. And you see if we had it there, there's a bit more scatter above and below that 45 degree line in the second component. And we'll see that in PLS always. The third component will have even more scatter, the fourth component, greater still, and so on. So the first component and the second component usually have a strong correlation in T1 versus U1, and T2 versus U2. 